as you were talking, I was thinking about uh, the other discovery, or at least I shouldn't say the other topic that you looked into, and that was red rain. I had not heard of that earlier, and I was wondering if you could go into that with the audience. Uh, that was a pretty fascinating uh, thing. Yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it, it was. In, in fact, I, I was first made aware of it with a letter that I had from a guy in India who was a professor of physics, and he said that... Uh, in 2001, in the year 2001, uh, and then the entire state of Kerala, which is sort of, I don't know, 100 uh, square kilometers at least, or a couple of hundred square kilometers, huge area, was um, uh, experienced red rain following uh, a, a sort of a, a huge thunderstorm. There was a sonic boom, he described, that uh, frightened people, the houses shook and so on, and and then following that, there was a, a, a downpour of rain that was almost uh, the color of blood. Uh, it lasted for about two or three hours, and uh, people were frightened and so on, and, and they collected some, some there were well, not many collections of the, of the rain, but there were some collections that were made. And he, as a physicist and a scientist, this guy called Godfrey Lewis, he examined the, the rain under the microscope, and he, he thought he saw living cells, red cells, uh, that were essentially um, sort of like bacterial or algae or something, but very peculiar type of bacteria or algae, if it was such. And so he said that, and he, and he, he thought that because of there was a sonic boom uh, prior to the rain, he assumed that this was a fragment of a comet that exploded in the, in the upper atmosphere, and... Uh, uh, led to the rain, or that the rain came from essentially from particles that were in this comet, in the top fragment of a comet. And uh, because he was aware of the work that we had done on uh, panspermia and comets bringing life and so on, he got in touch with me, and we had together, Godfrey and myself and two or three research students now, we've been looking at the red rain of Kerala, and we haven't come to any conclusion. There certainly are living cells. Living cells that do not resemble anything like the cells that we see on the earth. They are not algae that we can recognize. They are not bacteria that we can recognize. And we are not even sure that they replicate with DNA, that they use DNA as, wow. the, as a genetic material. So it, it is bizarre. And it, that's, oh. that's been around for uh, two or three, uh, uh, no, more than that, nearly five years now. We hadn't come to anything. Um, result. Uh, so in December, after the meteor showers, meteor falls in 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 Colombo, in Sri Lanka, in, um, uh, there was red rain also that, uh, suddenly that uh, appeared in, in Sri Lanka, and I was quite intrigued because I happened to be uh, I was born in Sri Lanka a uh, long while ago, and so I decided to go there and uh, get some samples of the red rain, which we are still analysing. It looks very similar to the red rain. Hmm. I think what happened is that this meteorite that broke up and fell all over the place contained within it the red rain cells, and the red rain cells were the centers around which ice and water condensed, and it came down as as rain, as red as red rain. Uh, so it's it's a, an ongoing mystery that has to be solved. I still don't know the answer to it. I think these are living cells. No question about it. It is not true that if you look at the Internet, it says that these red rain uh, cells have been identified as a certain type of algal cell. Totally untrue, because we've looked at that algae, uh, that particular type of algae, and they, they are extremely different. So it's, it's again, uh, um, the, in the Internet shows up as a mix, mixed blessing. You can put up something and say that this is all being solved and so on. And it sort of sticks with people. So there's no solution to the red rain of Kerala. And as far as the red rain of Sri Lanka is concerned, it seems to be very similar. Well, do, do those organisms reproduce? Do they replicate? Because certainly that is one of the basic criteria of life, along with obviously a lot of other things. But mm. are, have you been able to grow them in yeah, a culture? Yeah. You yeah, have. No, my, my students uh, really? work on the, on the Kerala red rain. Huh. Uh, found that they replicate in a standard nutrient medium, like oh. uh, what they use, uh, under pressure and uh, at high temperature. So 
Oh. They don't replicate under normal conditions. So if you put the if you put the stuff in a bowl of water and um, give it a bit of soup or something, it doesn't replicate. But if you heat it to uh, over a hundred degrees Celsius, hundred and twenty one degrees Celsius in a pressure cooker, then it replicates. Again it's oh. a, it's uh, it's a bizarre picture that is emerging. It's an alien it, it is. The, the, all it the is. signs wow. of uh, unidentified alien bug. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean obviously it wouldn't have come from wow. Uh, we had two quick questions that came in. Gail was wondering if you find some cultures more open to your ideas than others. Yes, I think that is the case. I find oh. that uh, the European, American, um, European cultures are still antagonistic. And I'm am amazed at what some of the statements that one hear that I have heard uh, in, as a criticism of these ideas. The statement is that this is an extraordinary hypothesis, and extraordinary hypothesis oh, wow. requires extraordinary uh, yeah. defense uh, or evidence in support of it. Now, that, I think that is bizarre because the extraordinary hypothesis would be to say that life is confined to the Earth. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, oh, okay. the Earth is just a minute <laughs> speck of dust in the whole context of the cosmos. So. It's the opposite that has to be um, maintained. Why is it that, uh, uh, why does my critics or our critics say that life is to be confined to the earth? Uh, you um, know, that's such a good point. That really mm -hmm. is. Uh, we so are also, think, yeah, uh, go ahead, I'm to, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, just uh, to answer your question quickly. Uh -huh. The cultures that are more open to uh, extraterrestrial life are, t funnily, uh, strangely enough, in Sri Lanka they're very open, India, Really? The Indian culture is open to uh, such ideas, and Japanese, and uh, evidently the Russians as well. Yeah, the, the Russians seem very open to it. I mean, as far as UFO <laughs> research there, um, I, I think the problems they have is the problem everyone has, is that there's just not enough data to formulate any hypothesis that has any backing at all because of the lack of data. Um, but but we had another comment that came in from Farusha, who's a huge fan of yours, and she was wondering if that if you thought that we have entered a more busy area of the galaxy. Uh, February and March fireballs have been increasing over the past ten years. I think so. I think this is the uh -huh. case. In fact, even over Sri Lanka, when I was doing my investigations in December and January. The, the frequency of fireballs, the frequency of UFO sightings, I mean, these are all, most of them have been uh, sort of put down by the general public as sightings of UFOs, mm -hmm. unidentified flying objects, and they have increased dramatically over the last uh, year or two. I would, say, I would say over the last one year, 12 months, they have maybe um, increased by a factor of 10 or 20 at least. So there's something happening. I think we are, we are probably the solar system is moving through uh, part of the interplanetary medium that has more debris, more uh, material, more living material, maybe. And um, so that, that, that's, I think that I would agree with that. Okay. Well, uh, where, where do you see this all going? I mean, uh, assuming that you finally get the credit that you so richly deserve, and this is accepted, uh, how do you think this will affect life on Earth, just culturally, philosophically, governmentally? I think it'll have enormous implications. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think it'll have enormous implications, not just as, uh, as a, a change of scientific or philosophical paradigm, when, when we um, recognize that life is external to the Earth, that there is a continuing input of bacterial genes, viral genes, living cells to the Earth, then the, uh, this, the impact this has on medical science, for instance, would be profound. Mm -hmm. right? We'd have to worry about uh, uh, the in inclusion of alien genes in our genome, and there's more than evidence, more than ample uh, point is now that we are, our genes, our human genome, is full of viral genes that are un unidentified. They're, they're just lying dormant there, yeah. and uh, they're probably potential for evolution, for further evolution. There's probably also potential for disease. Um, so I think there's a, there's a medical, bi bi biotech medical applications that 
would be unraveled as soon as people t- take this seriously and begin to to uh, collect the material that f- is falling from the sky, doing um, and do sort of genome studies on on them. It requires it requires uh, a change of attitude because, uh, as you said earlier, we need a small group of people like us cannot do not have the access to. Uh, equipment and the resources that are needed to... Well, uh, to, uh, uh, what it does need, though, is pioneers, and that's where you mm-hmm. are. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the hour. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here to quote, your again, your fan, Bill Smith. You are one of the great scientists of the current age with a direct line through Sir Fred Hoyle to Einstein and his peers. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. you. You're welcome. And... and